Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. This is the 13th Knowledge Cafe of the Integrated Policy Practitioners Network, also called IPPN, which is jointly managed by UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, the ILO, and the FAO. My name is Matthew Koniak. I am with the ILO office in New York. And we will start today with the fact that we are obviously in 2023 and that there are, that means seven years left to implement the SDGs. And yet, unfortunately, we are very far from implementing them. As per the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, we must rise higher to rescue the Sustainable Development Goals and stay true to our promise of a world of peace, dignity, and prosperity on a healthy planet. The issue is that if you look at the latest implementation report, 2022, most SDGs are facing difficulties. SDG 1 on poverty has seen four years of progress erased by COVID-19 and fueled by a rise in working poverty. SDG 2 on hunger suffers the consequences of the war in Ukraine and the related food shortages for the world's poorest people. SDG 4 faces an unprecedented crisis in education with over 147 million children who missed over half of in-person instruction during the pandemic. SDG 5 on gender equality is only but a distant dream if we consider, for example, that it would take another 40 years for women and men to be represented equally in politics. SDG 8, close to the heart of the ILO, on decent work and economic growth, faces a multiplicity of crises, health, economic, social, financial, and at the heart of it all, there are 200 million people who are currently in absolute poverty. In SDG 13, climate change, sending a code red warning to humanity with rising global temperatures. SDG 16 on peace faces a world in which a quarter of the population lives in conflict affected countries. I could go on, but clearly, clearly the SDGs need a push. And that is precisely why colleagues at UNDP have been developing a tool to do just that, that is, to plan and implement SDG breakthroughs in a variety of development contexts. And as you would have it, it is called the SDG push, the SDG push framework, and is being piloted in a number of countries, Indonesia, Moldova, Namibia, Peru, and South Africa. Today, we will focus on this tool and specifically on its application towards South Africa and Indonesia. So to make sense of all of this, we have a really great panel with three UNDP experts who will help shine a light on exactly what the SDG push is all about. I will introduce them shortly. First, our usual note for housekeeping. Please make sure that your microphones are muted to allow colleagues to hear the presenters. Do use the chat function to ask questions and to share your experiences and insights throughout the session. And after the presenters are done with their presentation, we will open the floor for discussion. So let's get started. And to set the scene, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Babatunde Abidoye, who is the Global Policy Advisor at the SDG Integration Team of UNDP in New York. Babatunde, floor is yours. So thank you very much, Matteo, and good evening, good morning, afternoon to everyone uh, joining. You know, Matteo, the your intro is great and uh, you know, sets uh, the context. And I think I'm gonna skip some of my slide, given the uh, given some of this things that you've covered. I think we are familiar with uh, the reg regression in many of the SDGs, as you've talked about, um, and a lot of the things that we thought we'll be covering today on the SDG push uh, was started because of the analysis that we did trying to understand. Uh, the regression in different SDGs. Uh, so we had a publication, uh, Teresa, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, we had a publication that helped look at uh, the COVID impact on the different SDGs. And the big part of that is the regression uh, that uh, that we're seeing, uh, not just in the SDGs, but also in the demand development indicators uh, as, as uh, our HDI, uh, HDR office publishes. And in that, uh, why we were thinking through that publication back then, uh, one of the things that uh, we were really focusing on was the, you know, is there a way, given all that is happening, given the multidimensionality in the, of the impacts and the crisis that we're seeing, 
is there a way that we can still be able to push towards achieving the SDGs, right? Um, and that's where the SDG push scenario uh, came in. And we're trying to work uh, within UNDP and with other partners to try and understand different set of policy interventions. And in those interventions, we grouped it into four areas, right? Social protection, green recovery, uh, digitalization, and governance. And uh, based on that, working with the University of uh, uh, Denver at Paddy Center, uh, we're able to see that uh, this set of interventions helps us move closer to achieving the SDGs. Uh, next slide. But while this is good, right, this uh, at, at the conceptual level tells us that, yes, this helps us to be able to achieve the SDGs faster. Uh, but then there's need to be able to understand what this means at the national level, right? Um, so at the, at the global level, we know that more than this it takes us faster, closer. But then uh, translating this to the national level is important. And that's where what we'll be talking about today in terms of the SDG push uh, uh, is, is uh, going to uh, take us closer to that. So here we categorize it into three, three main areas. Right? One is in terms of understanding the data, uh, understanding the status quo in the countries. So using data and robust evidence base, uh, to be able to say, okay, what is the gap uh, that exists in terms of the SDGs? There are 17 of them with 200 and something uh, it, you know, targets and indicators, 246 of them. Uh, we need data, we need some way of to be able to visualize that and make sense of with the ones that we're lagging behind. So that's where the first set comes in. Then the second part is on the sense making and the dialogue that is critical, right? Um, so it's, it, it's uh, it would be naive of us to say that it's uh, there's not a lot of work that has been done since 2015. Yes, we had COVID. Yes, there's been a different crisis. Uh, but then it's it's important for us to be able to come together and have a conversation on what is working, uh, why they might not be working, and uh, be able to bring those set of interventions that can help us to accelerate the SDGs. And then on top of that is the finance. And uh, a lot of this is echoed in the uh, policy brief that was just released by the Secretary General uh, earlier this uh, this month uh, on uh, the SDG stimulus and what we need to deliver on Agenda 2030. And for those of you that have not seen that uh, policy brief, it would be good for you to have a look at it because it highlights the fact that countries, a lot of countries are constrained uh, and uh, being able to have fiscal space to be able to invest in the SDGs right now uh, might be problematic. And we need some way to, to provide stimulus to the countries uh, in order to be able to move the needle uh, on that. Ne uh, next slide. So the SDG push uh, it's, uh, is something that we've been working on the past year, uh, funded by GIZ. Uh, with uh, with Germany and uh, with and a, a multidisciplinary design team, right? Uh, with a lot of colleagues from FAO, uh, UNICEF, ILO, and uh, UNDESA, and many other uh, UN city that has been working with us here to think through this process, right? Uh, because it's uh, you know, as we get go towards the SDG summit later this year, it's important for us to be able to. Uh, come together to understand how we make this push, right? Uh, at the national level, it's a uh, coordination with the RCO office and uh, my colleagues, uh, Ansia and Rogers will talk more about this work at the national level. Uh, it's led by the uh, the National Planning Commission in the countries uh, with the support of the UNDP and the rest of the UNCT. Um, and there, a lot of partnership that is important to make this work, right? uh, understanding the landscape and we need to bring all of that together. Uh, they have different flavor in, in different countries like Moldova, as you know, with the uh, energy crisis that is happening right now with uh, the Russia, uh, Ukraine war, there's a different focus in Moldova. Uh, but then South Africa, Namibia, Peru uh, also have uh, different uh, things that the governments are interested in and uh, bringing all of this together uh, in that respect. I think that's my last slide, right? Oh, the so on the framework. Uh, so the SDG push itself, as uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, like five uh, process, but it's uh, countries can get into this at different stages, right? So we have it as a starting with a scoping, 
mainly trying to understand the gaps, right? Um, acceleration and dialogue that is important to be able to understand the status quo, understand where we are, what is not working, but also thinking about uh, developing solutions that are long term and uh, important for the future. And then we focus a lot on modeling also, right? Uh, so if we uh, identify these accelerators, uh, are they going to lead, take us to the right pathway? And of course, in between all of this is how do you finance this? What is it going to cost? Right? And uh, being able to have a, a way to be able to move this forward uh, through the acceleration pathways. Uh, next uh, slide, Teresa. So to make all of this a little bit easier um, for country teams that is trying to apply this, we have developed different uh, assets that has some of it is the work that uh, has been done across the UN, uh, like the uh, UN DESA on how to you know, map out the SDG gaps, uh, to working with IFAO, UN Women, and other, other agencies to understand the best way to, to understand these gaps and what's on track and what is not on track. Uh, so that it makes it a little bit easier uh, for colleagues to be able to uh, identify those gaps right? and also be able to map it. Uh, we also have a machine learning <clears throat> algorithm that helps uh, you to you to upload VNR uh, or national development plans uh, and be able to use that to uh, understand what is uh, what is in those uh, documents and what is the focus on those documents. There's also interlinkages, which has been shown right now. Um, how do we understand linkages between different SDGs and uh, be able to come up with solutions that help us to, to maximize those linkages. Uh, and also, we also know that there's trade-offs as we made about that. So there's all these assets that we've developed and uh, you know, we can show with to find in the chats, uh, the link to the, to the diagnostic itself. Uh, and then from there, it's now been able to quickly uh, go over this, right? Uh, at the national level and start that conversation on what's needed uh, in order to be able to uh, push uh, on the SDGs. So with that, I will hand over now to my colleague Anshe uh, from the Indonesia office. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Babatunde, for really setting the scene, presenting the tool uh, uh, and where it stands at the global level. And like you said, now we have to quickly go to the country level to see exactly how it uh, how it performs there and, and really what it means. So let's travel east. Let's go to Indonesia, where it's evening already. So it's probably more appropriate to say good evening or salamat malam, as we say in Bahasa. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Miss Juliati uh, Sopakua uh, Anzie, who is the Senior Advisor for Program Integration and Development Analysis at UNDP in Indonesia. So Anzie has an impressive career she has worked with universities, research institutes, international NGOs, UN agencies, and she has focused a lot of her work on the environment and water resources and sanitation issues in developing countries. So, dear Ansia, the floor is yours for your presentation. Yes, thank you, Matthew. Um, can you confirm you can hear me okay? Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good evening. Um, Good afternoon, colleagues that are uh, that join us uh, this evening for me here yeah, this evening. Um, so I will uh, uh, share with you a little bit more on our work on SDG push. So thank you to Babatunde that have explained the framework. So we use the same the the framework that was shown uh, with the steps and um, with Indonesia. Can we go to my slide? Uh, please. Um, I will start it by saying that uh, the work in Indonesia was uh, requested actually by minister of minister himself when they were in New York for some meeting and they learned about SDG push. Um, and Indonesia developed their roadmap, SDG roadmap towards 2030 uh, before uh, before COVID uh, pandemic, um, so then they were learn they learned that the SDG push was was um, offering um, a methodology of, that can um, look at the effect of COVID and and using diagnostic uh, as well as sense making. So they asked 
uh, our office if they can be in uh, included in that uh, in the group of countries. So um, we then was happy to uh, to assist and um, and so we started the work with Babatunde teams and colleagues in New York. Um, so the the entry point, yeah. So th that's important. The entry point for Indonesia is to uh, to work with with Bapanas Ministry of Planning in SDG push, which the result will be um, the input for revision, revision of roadmap of SDG in Indonesia toward 2030. So this is a, we think that this is a strategic uh, entry point um, that we engage. We also want, I also want to mention that the work in Indonesia completely led by Bapanas, and as you might know, Bapanas in Indonesia is quite um, quite advanced in mainstream SDG as well as uh, achievement. But with COVID, obviously, like everybody else in the world, um, Indonesia also regressed many of the achievement. Um, so, with that entry point and the expected output, that the result will be hosted portfolio of inter integrated initiative um, government, Bapanas was thinking that this would be a good input and they asked us to do this with them. Okay, so let's look at what we have done in Indonesia in the next slide. Um, we went through, so um, if, you, uh, if you hear what Babatuni was saying, we, this <clears throat> approach used diagnostic, um, approach, but also sense making, and and that's to say that we use data driven and also expert driven, if you may. Yeah. So for the scoping that is like using diagnostic, Indonesia, <laughs> the results show that Indonesia uh, it have a gap on sustainable city target um, goal eleven, especially target eleven point one. Okay. So with that. Um, we contextualize the result. So the result, the diagnostic process spill out saying, okay, there is gap in sustainable city. Then we contextualize this with government and obviously to, uh, to advance sustainable city will require basic service, you know, health, education, water and sanitation, um, housing, affordable housing. Um, as well as uh, in, increased share of renewable energy and improve energy efficiency. So, so these were all um, considered um, based on, uh, on diagnostic and interlinkages analysis that is part of the diagnostic process. So basically what you see here in uh, the left side of the slide is the result of the scoping. Then we move to the dialogue. The dialogue is, is the sense making bring together a broad range of uh, stakeholder um, that will discuss about okay so the scoping said is how are we going to contextualize this and see and use that result see what the policy that is there are there policy what's what's the issue with the policy that is not you know that needs to be um, needs to be looked at and how to to strengthen all of this was discussed during the dialogue uh, and there was uh, the dialogue was done in december the 9th of december last year where we have uh, many government partners as well as um, as un agency rco um, and also private sector um, also in indonesia i want to share that in indonesia there is special Secretariat at national level that um, the SDG national SDG Secretariat, which uh, basically run the whole show for Indonesia, they are with Ministry of Planning. So the dialogue process allow for uh, for all for stakeholders to look at okay the scoping series and discuss and decide what can be the accelerators for Indonesia given. The result of the scoping. So this is where where we at. We were thinking that access to basic services, of course, um, affordable housing and slum upgrading, 
uh, integrated transportation and waste management, land tenure, and legal identity. So these are the accelerator that was discussed using various um, uh, methodology that, um, that result on, on this accelerator. So what's next? The next, uh, the next slide, please. Using the result from uh, the dialogue, right? So we have the dialogue. Um, the next one is the modeling. The modeling, we, we will introduce and propose scenarios that will aiming at, at simulating um, issues and policy options that to that can address some of the issues that was discussed and decided during dialogue. Um, and within that, uh, there will be consideration obviously because it's going to be costed. And so the financing side of things will be considered now. And in Indonesia, we also have INFF. So this, we will bring all this together and financing, but also um, the investment side of things. After that, then there will be acceleration roadmap. Now, I have a couple of points of key learning. Um, so SDG push is, is considered effective because it's using diagnostic, but also expert opinion. Um, the data obviously very key. And in Indonesia, government uh, insisted that they do not only want to use the data at the UN start, but using data from national level to, to articulate or to express the reality um, better. Um, effectiveness of dialogue is, is very, very important because uh, it, it's often it depends on who, uh, who attended the dialogue, you can probably have a different result. Um, and so we were very uh, lucky to have people that are expert in what they do and ministry and, and uh, UN agencies. Uh, and the last thing I will stop here by saying that um, obviously, uh, linking this or the entry point uh, to what government really needed now uh, for for the tools like this to be effective and to be used and to be so it's be useful but also sustainably used um, in the future. I'll stop here and uh, later if there is a question, I'm happy to answer. Thank you very much. Back to you, Matthew. Thank you so much, NCA, for your presentation for presenting really what the SDG push is all about in Indonesia. Um, it's very clear. And yet I would like to encourage everyone to submit their question through the chat box if you if you have any questions are already coming and we'll try to go through them uh, at the end of the session. But for now, let's go to UNDP this time in South Africa with uh, Rogers Liwayo, who is an economics advisor. Rogers has worked as an economist in academia, policy advisory services in many countries across Africa, and he's also written several research policy papers on macroeconomic policies for stability, growth, poverty reduction, as well as financing the sustainable development goals. So Rogers, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh Thank you, Matteo, for such a generous uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Good, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, as already highlighted by Babatunde, there are five pilots of this SDG push, and South Africa is one of the pilots with our neighbor, Namibia. Uh, and um, just to highlight that you know, this SDG push uh, Teresa, if you can go to the first slide, please. This SDG push was a request from the National Planning Commission to the UN country team, you know, to help them, you know, to really accelerate the SDGs. And this request was done under the previous mainstreaming acceleration policy support process. And, and really that request, really what the ask of the National Planning Commission was how the UN can help them to really implement the national development plan. Because that national development plan actually mainstreamed the SDGs and even Agenda 2063, which is the Africa you know, regional agenda. But that plan did not have an implementation plan. So really, 
you know, the National Planning Commission came to the UNCT to say, how can you help us to come up with an implementation, you know, strategy for the plan? And just to highlight that in 2022, the National Planning Commission also did an evaluation of that NDP 10, how the and NDP 2030 of how they are doing. And it's a mixed bag. They are doing some well in some sectors, but they're not doing well in the three triple development challenges which South Africa faces, which is high inequality, high poverty, and high unemployment. And of course, recently we also have this issue of energy shortage. So, so really, and they and they produced a paper of really what are the the critical path to implement that plan. And the second uh, request was really, you know, how can the UNCT help them to close the development, you know, the development gaps, in you know, which actually even these tri three triple development challenges have been worsened by COVID. And of course, UNDP we've been we've actually done a UN socioeconomic impact assessment and also the impact of uh, you know COVID on micro and informal business. And what we found out that actually poverty, inequality, and unemployment actually worsened. And if you look at the latest World Bank figures on poverty, looking at the upper middle income country, um, you know, poverty level, about more than half of the population is actually living below poverty. So really the idea is how can we help the country to actually address the three, three triple development challenges? So our point of entry on the SDG push was actually, is actually trying to see how we can use this SDG push to address these three triple development challenges. Next slide, please. So just to you know to 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 you know, to, to to do a deep dive of what we think this uh, SDG push will do is it will identify the SDG gaps, and it will also provide evidence-based SDG accelerators. And of course, it will estimate because once we once we find those accelerators, we need investments. So it will need actually to estimate the investments which are required, and also provide you know financing mechanisms given the limited fiscal space which actually currently prevailing in the country, and also suggest possible partnerships for SDG acceleration. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of progress, I think my colleagues have talked to you about even the, the initial presentation of the steps of this SDG push. We have tried religiously to follow those steps, starting with the scoping note, looking at the country's progress toward the SDGs, and what are the challenges? And that scoping note highlighted quite a number of challenges. One issue is the human capital. If you look at the education sector, in like that, you know, the education sector is producing the skills which are not required by, you know, employers. The other thing is the social protection that, of course, though South Africa has got a huge, you know, one of the huge social protection network, you know, you know system in the, you know, even in the whole world, even in terms of the resources they invest, this is not linked to the labor market. And also the issue of land reform, issues of even logistical bottlenecks. When we talk of even the transport sector, we've got this issue of a monopolies like Transnet, which really manages the rail and there are issues of inefficiency there. And when we come to electricity, I've already alluded to you that now we are on stage six of load shedding. And what stage six means is that you go for four hours without electricity. So you can see that's one of the binding constraints which we have even for, you know, to jumpstart the economic growth of the country and even address employment. And of course, the, the other fact things which came out were also even the way the government works, that it works in silos. How can you have, you have a whole government approach to really address the development challenges? And that then fed into the stakeholders dialogue. And the stakeholders actually, they, we held that stakeholders dialogue on the 14th and 15th of November last year. And it was a homogenous group government, civil society, UN, and also we brought in, in even some, there's one civil society which has done quite some interesting work on addressing even youth unemployment in South Africa, which is called Accelerator Lab. So we actually made them also present that type of study to actually enrich the stakeholders' dialogues. 
And then what we identified from those stakeholders dialogue really reinforced what the scoping note, you know, actually found out. And that is now feeding into scenario building, the modeling. And we are relying on trying to do some, you know, CG modeling and micro simulations to actually identify the, the, you know, the acceleration pathways. And then, of course, that will feed into how do we fi finance those accelerators? Next slide, please. Just to give you a feel of what we have been doing, because we've already gone a bit further in the modeling and we have been discussing even these modeling scenarios with our counterpart, the National Planning Commission. And we actually have weekly calls with them, which they join also. And we, we, have, we are looking at basically you know, four scenarios, the business as usual, where we are saying, look, South Africa continues what it is doing in terms of implementing the NDP uh, 2030, the economic recovery and reconstruction plan, which came up, you know, with, uh, you know, to, to address the impact of COVID and other, other policy measures, the, and so on. And then we are trying to come with three scenarios, which compares with uh, that usual, that business as usual. And the first, the, the second scenario is really the employment scenario, where we try to address this issue of skills mismatch, saying if we address the skills gap, you know, through even immigration, through reform of the education system, how, how will that affect growth and these three triple development challenges, which I've referred to? The third scenario is really trying to, you know, to address this energy and infrastructure constraint to see what is the impact on growth and the three triple development challenges. And last but not least is also the fiscal reform, which is the, you know, we, are to, we construct a conducive fiscal environment to boost economic growth and employment. And of course, as I indicated, these scenarios are not cast in stone because as I'm talking with you today, we are waiting for the, for the, for the budget for this fiscal year. And we are aware from the pointers which we got from the, president on his state of the nation address, which that you know, now the state of nation address, you know, they're going to put financial skin to it and even policies of going, how are they going to address these triple development challenges? We may have to circle back and look at these, at these, um, at these, uh, at these scenarios and see how we can modify them to really fit the context which we are dealing with. But of course, I have to highlight on the energy scenario, we also have to take into account you know, the just energy investment platform, investment plan, which the country presented at COP27 and try to bring it there. And that actually links even the SDGs and even, and even the Paris Agreement. And I want to emphasize before I conclude that the modeling which we are doing, it's up to 2030 because the NDP is up to 2030 and the SDGs, but we are extending it by five years because if I alluded to, you know, in Africa, we also have our regional agenda, Agenda 2063, which goes up to 2035. So we are trying to extend our modeling to 2025 to take account of the Agenda 2060 and see how this modeling will actually address these three triple development challenges. And I would like to emphasize though, if, though that if our, though our point of entry is these three triple development challenges, we are trying to model as much SDGs as possible based on the available data. And in our modeling, we're actually modeling all the social goals, the economic goals, goal 13, the climate, the, the you know, and goal 17. Some of the goals, we can't model them basically because of data limitations. But we, I think we are on the right, we are actually on the right uh, track in terms of what we are doing. And some of this work will actually feed into the country's VNR, which they want to present in 2024, which they've already started, you know, preparing the SDG report being led by statistics essay. And this will also feed into the review of their medium term strategic framework, which is actually their five year implementation plan of NDP 10. So all this work, which we are doing, we are working, we are trying to make sure that it, you know, is really feed into what, what they are doing. Let me end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rogers for your excellent presentation and for presenting it to us all these scenarios uh, coming from, from where you are in, in South Africa. So we have now heard you 
Anzie and Babatunde, and let's go now to the session on Q&A, question and answer. Once again, please feel free to go to the chat box and ask any question you'd like, and we'll try to address them to our, um, our presenters. Let's just start with a first question that I see, which I believe is addressed to Babatunde, which is what was, just starting from the beginning really, what was, what were the criteria of the countries selected? And also, is the initiative always available? So maybe you you, you, you can clarify that point, Babatunde, thank you. Yeah, no, thank, <clears throat> thanks, Matteo. And uh, I think the question is from, Trying to check who the question is from. Okay, I can see right it's now. It's from it's from Dauda Dauda. Okay. okay, yes. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Dauda. Thanks, Dauda, for the question. Yeah, so when we started this uh, about a year or so ago now, right? Uh, part of the focus, initial focus was let's figure out together in the design team uh, with the rest of our colleagues uh, in the UN uh, on what does it take to accelerate the SDGs and to make this push. Uh, so a lot of the focus was on trying to bring all the different tools together that can help us to do that effectively. And then we said, okay, as we're building that, there's uh, there's need to be able to test this right, in a couple of countries uh, to see what it will look like. Uh, and that's where working with, uh, as you know, Roger has mentioned earlier, there's entry point from the previous maps uh, that is led across the UN. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, for like in Indonesia, a request from the government seeing the publication on the SDG push. Um, and we wanted to have representation across uh, in the different regions that we work in. Uh, so working with GIZ and the countries that they are, you know, supporting, that's how you know, we selected the five countries to test. Now that we're trying to finalize all the testing and advancing on this, and you can see from the presentation from Anshi and, uh, and Rogers, uh, and in the build up to the SG Summit now is to make this available uh, globally uh, to, all the, uh, to all the countries. So that's a that's a plan now, uh, and uh, that's why we have the different assets. Uh, we're building the different training material, uh, so that it's not because it's not as you can see, it's not just a UNDP team, right? Uh, we're not uh, with something that the countries and the government and other UNCT uh, colleagues can be able to uh, provide at the national level. Thanks. Oh, uh, thanks, thanks, Babatunde. So just to follow up, so if another country wants to come into the picture, that is still possible. Exactly, yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay, very good. Let's now go to a next question, which comes from Ranjita to, I believe, to NZA. So NZA, the, the question is about the private sector. Where does the private sector stand in accelerating SDGs and in the context of the push? If you could. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ranjita, for the question. Um, yeah, for, I guess, in the context of the process, we involve private sector in the dialogue, right? So we want to, in the discussion, you will ask, um, there are exercise or, or steps where, um, you know, we consider the current policy option or the current policy that is implemented, but also from private sector, what they are doing, or what they are doing differently. So. So in the process, private sector is um, is involved or encouraged to involve. But in Indonesia, in in the bigger picture, uh, private sector is very very active. Um, in fact, the four all the four um, stakeholder pillars: government, uh, academia, civil society, um, and private sector are very very active in Indonesia. Um, and and uh, the country, including UNDP, is uh, working with private sector, develop new business model. Um, for example, in the context to develop business model for various um, program in that addressing different issues. Uh, a, a lot of uh, issue in, with energy and climate uh, digitalization is very big. Uh, in in the context of the discussion specifically for SDG push with 
um, with affordable housing. So affordable in Indonesia, in Jakarta alone, it's backlog of 11 million, um, well, sorry, 1 million, um, sorry, 11 million, the, the government only can have 1 million. So there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of need uh, for affordable housing, uh, but you know, the mortgages are too high. Um, they are not very sustainable. Access to finance are, are not uh, are, are not accessible for a low in, income community. So all of these are are you know it, it is very important obviously to have private sector on the table. So um, we are especially UNDP we are working with various um, uh, private sector but also with association that is CADIN Association of uh, Private Sector in Indonesia right. Um, and, and try to solve digitalization, um, climate change, uh, energy transition now in Indonesia. But yeah, I hope I answer uh, specifically for the for the SDG push we are doing, but also offer all uh, in Indonesia with the SDG. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Anzia. Yes, that, that, that's that's very clear. So that was about the private sector, and perhaps I can just. Uh, provide a follow-up question to you or to Rogers. Maybe we'll start with Rogers. We spoke about the private sector. Now, what about parliament? The question that comes from Doina Gimici to either of you, and again, let's start with Rogers, is was parliament involved in the stakeholder dialogue stage and uh, or any other stages of the SAG push in, in your countries? And if not, are there plans to involve parliament going forward? Yeah. So maybe Rogers, you want to start? Yes, I I just I have to highlight that you know in the stakeholders dialogue, actually um, Parliament was not part of the dialogue process, but we have got plans really to engage them. And uh, even the modeling which we are doing, when we circled back with the National Planning Commission, their technical team, they actually said, look, we need to to open this to a wider group, even to the planning commissioners, because the, the National Planning Commission has got planning commissioners who are really experts in quite a number of even the pillars of the plan. So really there is a, and then they are really trying to see how we can bring quite a number of stakeholders, you know, to really, you know, enrich this SDG push. And of course, recently also, the government has also been trying to engage parliament in quite a lot of things. And to just give an example, just before COP, you know, the presidential climate commission, which is leading on the just uh, transition and even their task force on financing the just transition, which came up with the just transition investment plan actually engaged parliament in a workshop. And uh, so, we are working, we are trying to see how we can work with them. And uh, just to highlight that sometime last year, actually the, you know, the, you know, the parliament actually asked us to come up with a paper which can look at how can we strengthen the, law, the role of parliament in implementing, you know, development plans. So we, we've done that paper with them. And one of the things which came out of that paper is how can we strengthen the role of parliament in terms of implementation and monitoring of the SDGs, even in terms of following the money that really are uh, their resources, which are allocated to really advance the SDGs. Because what we extended to happen in most countries is most countries have mainstreamed the SDGs in their, in, in, in their development plans. But when you look at the link between you know, financing and the plan, it's, it's, it's lacking. And of course, even South Africa, we don't have a financing plan for NDP 2030. So I think this is, these are some of the areas which we are seeing as the weaknesses and actually thinking that parliament can actually play a huge role in terms of even, you know, making sure that, you know, there is really, you know, oversight on the part of the executive in what they say and, uh, and so on, over. Thank you, Roger. So good to hear that the parliament has a great potential, can play a major role. How about in Indonesia, Anzia? Is, uh, was parliament yeah. involved in those discussions? Uh, thank you. No, no. Um, parliament is not, was not in the in our dialogue. Yeah, so that, that's clear. 
However, in Indonesia, I think the discussion with parliament um, happened all the time. And I think it, it is a good way of understanding how parliament works, what interests them, how best to communicate with them. Um, inviting them to the dialogue like that, uh, they might not come, you know? So I think what's secretary, um, SDG secretariat and many of us that are working with uh, Bapanas on, on advancing SDGs, looking at opportunity with connecting with specific commission within, um, within the parliament, because there is um, parliament for SDGs, I forgot the, act, the actual name, but there is a commission of sort within parliament that look at how implementation of SDG in Indonesia budgeting as, as, as of their, uh, their role. Uh, but also there is certain uh, specific commission to work on, on digitalization, a specific com commission that work with um, energy. So this is how Indonesia um, community of SDG, if you may, uh, connect to parliament, which I think uh, is, a, is a more effective way to, to, to advocate for, for issues and and, and financing and uh, oversight that is that is uh, related to their role. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anze. That that that's clear. So now we are going back to you, Babatunde. Uh, we have a question back on the, the, the tool itself. Uh, from this question is from Juliana Gar uh, Gargiolo, um, and so. She thanks, uh, she thanks all of you for the great presentations. And as that regarding the tools available for the pilot countries, they have a web interface, online toolbox, guidance docs, SDG diagnostics. But her question is, do they have any sort of regular forum for the pilot countries to discuss how the SDG push implementation is going for them? What is working? What is not working? What are the lessons learned that can be useful for others and so on? Uh, thanks, Matteo, and hi, uh, Juliana. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, I think the it's very important, and it's a big part of the focus this year. Right? Um, so we spent a year now developing this and you know, testing it. Uh, so what we want to do this year is to start to share knowledge and you know share uh, learnings uh, from the different countries, and that's part of the current conversation with the uh, with GIZ uh, on the work. For the focus for this year, especially to have a learning session uh, sometime in April that we're planning to to bring everybody together and see what we've learned from all of this and uh, how uh, experiences from South Africa can inform Peru or or inform uh, Indonesia's work. Right? Um, so that's uh, something that is important. Uh, we've also been putting together learning uh, monthly learning uh, documents that we've been. Uh, from what we're seeing from each other countries uh, to be able to make available uh, for people to be able to have, uh, see uh, how this is going. Uh, and and then we'll, I think we meet, uh, we try to meet every quarter uh, to, you know, across uh, all the pilots, which is something that is important to you to open up uh, as we go. Uh, just to quickly add that uh, for on the parliament question, I remember uh, Last year, we, the parliament from Indonesia actually had a mission to the New York, uh, where we presented the work of the SDG push to them. Um, and uh, they had different questions in terms of how do you implement this and what how do you make a regulation and laws that are essentially there were questions around carbon taxes and uh, issues around that, especially for a country like Indonesia, uh, interested in issues like that. So, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Baba Tunde. Uh, let's go back now, back to, to Rogers in Africa, because we have a, a question that comes to us from Kenya, uh, from Robert Papa, and who says that in all our SDG meetings, the issue of data always comes up. So the question is really, what are we doing about it? In Kenya, the National Statistics Office, um, the KNBS has embarked on using citizen-generated data. It has come up with a quality assurance framework which uh, such data is subjected to before it can be used as official statistics. So broadly speaking, considering the, the big challenge regarding data, 
how are you addressing how are you addressing it in the context of the SAG push? Maybe we can start with you and then we can then maybe move to Indonesia for that same question. No, thank you for such an uh, interesting question. I think data is an issue and we are all aware that with COVID actually even most of the surveys, you know, stopped. But I would like to also highlight that parallel to this, there is also some work which is going on in trying to see how we can improve even household data to actually, you know, report on the SDGs. And South Africa actually, we have had there's a consultant who actually has been have been doing some work, of course, again supported by our colleagues from H headquarters and UN DESA, who have actually tried to look at South Africa's experience. And of course, that assessment, actually, there are a lot of lessons which countries can learn from South Africa because South Africa, when you look at their how their their data in the strategy for where the, the, you know, how they collect their data. They don't collect de their data for one purpose. They've got uh, this indicative data strategy, which they have, which actually that data, they use it to report on the NDP, the NDP 2030, Agenda 2063, the SDGs, and also the, the SADAC, because also South Africa is a member of SADAC, which is the South, Africa, South African Development Community. It has got an indicative development plan. So when they collect data, they are meant to feed into reporting on all those you know, development plans and regional plans. And, uh, and if you look at them, they actually have a robust system in terms of data. And also, like as I indicated, the statistics essay is actually in the process of preparing the SDG report for 2023, which will feed into the VNR for 2024. But before they embarked on that, they called all the stakeholders to really look at what data sources are available, even metadata, trying to define the data and so on. And that involved national government, private sector, even civil society and so on. And that metadata, even some statistical organization some CSOs even came with uh, the data they are collecting. So there is also this move to have citizen generated data. And if I can actually try to highlight, if one looks at even how many indicators they were reporting on when we did that metadata analysis, per each SDGs, actually the, they've increased the indicators they are collecting, basically because they are using quite a number of data sources and even some um, some citizen generated data but what needed to happen was even this citizen generated data it, it needed to go through some quality assurance and so on so there is a, and also there is also this move towards big data you know trying to see how you can harvest some of this big data so of course i think it's work in progress and of course as i indicated some of the challenges is some surveys actually had to be, you know, normally when they collect this data, they, they've stopped. But I think there's been some, some innovative ways which have been done, like even the last census was actually, you know, most of it was virtual and it was actually, you know, using even, uh, you know, technology to collect it. And, uh, and actually they did it last year. And of course, there were some challenges in one province like the Western Cape but they were overcome. So we anticipate with the publication of the census results, we'll actually have a much richer source of data. And also to highlight that South Africa stats essay, they also have what they call an SDG data portal, where it's like uh, where you can go there, you see how they are doing, how many indicators they are reporting for SDGs, the data gaps, and so on, and even the progress. And that sort of helps them in sort of uh, working to see how they can address those data gaps. Let me end there, over. Thanks, thanks so much, Rogers. And we're getting a bit closer to the, to the end of this very interesting session. We still have time for one or two questions. So let me go back to you, Anzie. If you want to expand on the data issue in Indonesia, please do so. But also, I would like to ask, and this question will pertain to others as well, how do you relate to UN cities and to other UN agencies in the context of the SAG push? How is the coordination process actually actually taking place to uh, 
to, to embrace the tool at the country level. So uh, NZA, floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I will touch on the data um, a little bit after this, but for the work with UNCT, we uh, coordinate quite, quite closely. We, um, since, uh, since the beginning, since the plan uh, of, um, of the SDG push for Indonesia, we communicate because in Indonesia, we have SDG working group uh, for the UN agency for which we uh, share, but also talk about various support. Uh, so it comes as, as a coordinated support from UN in Indonesia to government various ministry. So SDG push was one of them that we discussed with them, uh, with everybody. And then we, um, uh, UN agency colleagues were involved in the various um, steps, uh, including the dialogue, uh, but also we regularly um, update uh, colleagues in the, that, that come to um, SDG working group. So it is very well informed and, and people ask questions, but people also, contributing um, and and so this is a good segue to data because in you know with data for example I mentioned um, in the beginning that Indonesia didn't use only the data from uh, UN staff but the data from national so at the Bapanas level UN agencies we uh, that was one of the support was given to uh, to SDG secretary that is um, it's called uh, dashboard, SDG dashboard, Indonesia SDG dashboard. Yeah, so that was one of the, some of the effort that we are we're doing. The issue is with the pillar, environmental, environment pillar, the, because the social pillar, many of the goals are, um, are covered with basic survey by uh, statistic office, um, National Bureau of Statistics, but the, indicator and data that in environment uh, pillar are new, right? So it wasn't collected specifically by, by statistic office. So these are, these are there are a lot of work uh, that is done in Indonesia to make sure that the data, not just collecting the data, but meet um, the metadata uh, and, and it's statistically rigor. And so these are all uh, led by Papanas, led by Minister of Planning, for uh, in which um, minister uh, sorry in which uh, statistic office is under right so led by statistic office uh, development of the data how to use uh, uh, big data thick data all kinds of advanced uh, statistic uh, new statistic way of collecting data are being uh, being explored in Indonesia and Indonesia have one of the best statistic statistic office national statistic office very very advanced. But uh, yes, but there are very real issue with uh, data that map um, uh, the rigorous need, rigor need of metadata of, of uh, SDG indicators as we know this. But yeah, to, to, to be uh, short, there are a lot of work that done by government, by UN agency and, and academia as well. Thank Over you, thank you. you. And thanks, Sanzia, thanks so much. We have one minute left, maybe in the next 30 seconds, Baba Tunde, do you want to have the word of the end? Perhaps you want to build also on this coordination with other UN agencies. Yeah, no, thanks, Matteo, and thanks, everyone. I know it's uh, we're trying to run into a lot of meetings, but this has been very helpful um, in the build up to the SDG summit. It's important for us to be able to uh, work together on how to uh, you know, support the countries on threatening the SDGs. Uh, we think this is a methodology that uh, we've been able to work on together with uh, the rest of the UN uh, is a good way to, to take us in that direction. Um, and there's it, it brings together different work that we do, right? Um, it's not just uh, data, it's not just modeling, it's a dialogue, it's uh, financing, uh, and being able to you know, bring all of that in a way that we can be able to understand uh, what is not working, what is working, and how we move forward. So uh, we look forward to working with everyone uh, on this. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks, Babatunde in New York, Rogers in uh, South Africa, and Zia in Jakarta. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the IPPN organizing team, I'd like to thank all of you 
and all of the participants for really sharing your experiences with us in today's coffee chat. I invite you to join the IPPN network to continue the conversation. You will be able to access that presentation recording of today's session and all the other relevant resources on the IPPN platform through the link that is posted in the chat. So we look forward to seeing you again in our next session that will take place in March. And until then, I wish you a great rest, rest of your day or evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Mathieu. You. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Uh, Thank Bye. you, everybody. Thank you for Bye. joining. Bye. 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 Bye.